I'm Laura Blyle. I am the uh, Director of External Engagement here at the Research Park and um, really happy to see everyone. I, uh, I work on the community building um, portfolio of the Research Park. If you ever have any of ideas or speakers in your organization that you think would be a great asset for us, please don't hesitate to reach out. I see Beth on camera, so I'm going to throw over the intro to her. Oh, and I guess I should say we have a question. We usually do have a question of the day. So question of the day today is, of course, related to, I want to know what's your favorite summer fruit? We just went, I my, took my kids strawberry picking the other day and it was really fun, so. Well, when I think of summer fruit, I guess I think of things that I can only get in the summer. So I think I'm gonna go with cantaloupe um, because you just don't see those, at least here in the Midwest, we don't see those pop up very often um, except in the summertime. So that's gonna be my answer. Um, hello everybody, I'm Beth Ladd. And I am the site director for the D Next, D is in distribution, innovation lab on behalf of the American Supply Association here in the research park. I will do a little intro to Shelly if she's going to join us, I guess by audio or video, Shelly, hopefully you're there. She is our, one of our newest employees. I would say newest, except for Emily started this week. So now you're old, Shelly. <laughs> started a few weeks ago. And she is leading the Illinois FAST Center, so Small Business Innovation Research Program for um, small businesses in Illinois, throughout the state of Illinois. But Shelly will tell you more of her background. She's a PhD from biochemistry at Illinois and worked at Baxter. You want to tell us a little bit more, Shelly? Welcome to the group. Sure, thank you. Um, well, Laura covered a lot of it. I uh, graduated with my PhD at, um, at U of I, and then I worked for Baxter Healthcare for a while. And then I spun out some technology and started a startup company um, based in Chicago. And then I have been doing consulting for a number of years, helping uh, startup companies with their grants. And just recently I joined the FAST Center, Center so I'm excited to be working with all of you. Um, my favorite fruit. Um, actually, I love kiwi. So that's one I find more in the summertime. So that is a favorite of mine. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have you pass it over to Rebecca. I am, um, you mentioned Cynthia. Cynthia left us and I started in her spot at Enterprise Works as the incubator operations manager. So that's where I am. Um, I graduated with two degrees from the U of I. So I'm coming home to work at my alma mater here. So I'm happy to do that. I started about March. Um, summer fruit, when I was pregnant with my first daughter, I ate peaches like eight a day and so and I still like them but not that much. Thanks Rebecca. Um, so I, I see more people of our team who've been braved their cameras on but um, and now I see that team Motorola has uh, joined us so through Craig but we'll get to you all later so yes I, I see that the team is they're in the house in the research park so um, but uh, if any of our other friends either want to come on camera or to go off mute and introduce yourselves, I see Indu uh, here, who's one of our Enterprise Works tenants. And I just was emailing with her. So, Indu, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, thank you very much. As both Laura said, like, sorry, I'm eating as well my lunch, like, which we got complimentary today. Uh, thanks, Laura, for introducing Shelly. Like, pleasure seeing you in, like, um, uh, your picture as well today, Sherry. Um, I'm so happy to get to know you as well. Um, when I consulted Laura about our SPIR matching funds, like by the state, which is exciting news. And um, yeah, as um, Laura said, I am now uh, we are now our companies at Research Park Enterprise Works. Uh, I'm from Fruit Vaccine, uh, President and CEO of Fruit Vaccine Incorporated. We are developing vaccines orally delivered vaccines, uh, fruit-based vaccines. Laura brought, brought up the uh, topic of like favorite fruit for the summer. Like, so we are developing fruit-based vaccines. So if you are interested in, uh, please um, get onto our website. I'll post our website on the chat room here. Um, and um, yeah, pleasure meeting you and looking forward to listening to the talk today. Thank you so much. Indu. Oh. Marika is on video. Do you want to introduce yourself? 
Uh, sure. Apologies. I was uh, doing a quick drop off initially. So <laughs> I was had my camera off. Or was, um, but I'm uh, Marika Baraka. Uh, I actually, as of about two months ago, am now uh, director of enterprise content for Singularity University, which is a Bay Area based company. Um, we are in the space of uh, uh, exponential technologies and kind of executive uh, learning community uh, for those dealing with disruptive technologies and innovation. Um, I, in terms of my favorite fruit, um, I'm going to have to say blueberries. It's partly the nostalgia factor. Um, I actually, as a kid, hated blueberries, uh, did not think they tasted good, but that's because I'd never actually had Michigan blueberries straight off the bush <laughs> uh, in, in Michigan. So, um, uh, but anyway, Mike, so it's been a favorite kind of excursion. I have a sister that lives near a number of blueberry farms, and that is kind of a perennial family trip to visit and pick blueberries. So that, that's my answer. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Marika. And that's a new job you with working locally in town before that. Yes. Laura, if you want to point um, another person out, I see, I know we saw physically earlier, about an hour ago, Jenny Kim, who's now at Agco. Jenny, do you want to join us? Did I lose her? Nope. All right. Joanna. Sorry. sorry. Oh, nope. There she is. Sorry. I was just getting back to the office. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Kim. Uh, as Laura said, I was just, just three weeks ago. I was uh, part of the team at Research Park, um, but I'm now currently site coordinator at the Agco Acceleration Center. So I'm um, excited to be a part of that team. Um, I think we're doing favorite fruits as in transit. Um, I also really like peaches in the summer. Thanks. Marisa, looks like you might be in Enterprise Works somewhere. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Marissa. I'm a rising junior at U of I and I'm studying advertising. And I am at Enterprise Works, you're right. I'm the communications and social media intern here. And my favorite fruit in the summer is probably watermelon. And I like to put a little bit of salt on it and it tastes really good. So I'd recommend that watermelon with salt. Thanks, Marissa. I see Joanna on camera. So Joanna has uh, been on actually helping us do a lot of programming. So if you're interesting in, interested in her meetup group, I'm sure she'll tell you all about that. But Joanna, good to see you. Good to be here. So tell us about uh, what you do and uh, your meetup group and of course your favorite fruit in the summer. Yes. So I'm an enterprise solutions architect, meaning I build stuff for computer infrastructure. Um, or I design things for computer infrastructure. And I work for Red Hat, which is a big Linux based and hyper cloud software company. And um, I've been running a meetup that's centered around infrastructure as code and infrastructure automation for, I don't know, six or seven years now. And um, we met at Enterprise Works right up until March of last year. So. <laughs> So now we're just meeting up online, but we're still we're still going. Um, and my favorite fruit is grapefruit. I love grapefruit. I saw Zoe on camera quickly. I don't know if uh, Zoe, you want to give a say hello and give a introduction. We'll jump. I saw Pat Jang, who's a CEO and founder of a startup company. Pat, are you on? We'll keep going quick so that we don't take all of Tanisha's. Yes, I'm on. Oh, here's Pat. Taking a minute to uh, click. Okay, just one sec. All right, see me? Okay, hi everybody. Um, Women in tech, that sounds important. I always want to support, but not always around. And this time I saw it and I said, I'm gonna try to make it. So here I am. Um, I was at Inter Enterprise uh, from, from the start. 
when it was still under construction and it was there for uh, quite a few years and really appreciate all the supports that's provided by the um, by the uh, by the organization. Um, and uh, okay, I'm with Mimosa Acoustics and we are um, specialized in hearing evaluation technology, trying to bring, um, we've been doing a lot of small business innovation research uh, projects. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a wonderful program. And then um, my favorite fruit for the summer comes to mind immediately is watermelon. In a hot day, it feels good to think about it. Thanks, Pat. And Shelly, note Pat, long history of SBIRs. You might tap her as a speaker sometime. Um, we have had numerous new team members. Emily's on camera, so I'll let Emily introduce herself, who's no stranger to the research park. Hi, everyone. Oh, geez. Sorry, Emily and I are in the same office, and so there's feedback when she turns her audio on. <laughs> it's the multiple Zoom in a room problem. <laughs> if anybody else has had this issue, I'm sure it's come up, so. All right, one of you go, Kathy or Emily. I'm Kathy MacArthur. I do events and programming here at the Research Park. Um, my favorite fruit is mango steen. I, I know a lot of people don't know what that is, so I put a little link in the chat. It's um, native to Southeast Asia, where I'm from, and it's really hard to, to get a hold of it. So um, Emily's going to come over and say hi on my camera real quick. <laughs> <laughs> hi, I'm Emily Neal. I just started um, with the research park team last week, actually. And um, I'm working with uh, Laura on workforce development and um, talent. <laughs> and I was in the research park for the previous four years working with for jump trading um, in their FinTech uh, intern program. And I also have experience in marketing and um, events. Your favorite fruit? Favorite fruit. <laughs> Bananas or... Uh, or a grapes, I would say. <laughs> Welcome, Emily. And see, all these people who are, are new, but Sarah, now you don't seem so new on our team. I think you're on. Yep, I'm here. Hold on a second. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I started in October. I'm the new accounting um, associate. Um, I really like working here so far. It kind of gives me a lot of different experiences and opportunities to work with people, not only in, you know, just accounting and finance and doing the numbers, which obviously I enjoy, um, but it gives me a good look at tech in a way that I have never experienced before. So I'm really enjoying that. Um, in terms of my favorite fruit, I think I'm going to have to go with watermelon, although I've never had it with salt. So I don't know if I'm going to try that, but I will consider it. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. All right. If we don't see you on video, I think we're going to maybe move on, Laura. Uh, it's and, like a plan. OK. So, you want to formally introduce Tanisha? And I will go. I am, again, Laura Ferrix, the executive director of the Research Park. And my favorite fruit are nectarines, especially in the summer when they're ripe. Thank you. So I will just say. Um, I love the what all of you saying peaches. So funny enough, last uh, last summer, just personal story. I'm sure this has happened to us. Is that my my daughter ate a peach, her favorite fruit, and all, she had this weird thing happen to her mouth, and we're like, "What's going on with you? We didn't put two and two together." Anyway, the end of the story is yes, you can develop a peach allergy, which is very very sad for her um, after 12 years of eating peaches. So anyway, just goes to show you can develop an allergy at any time. And when it's your favorite fruit, that's super, super upsetting, but we're working through it. Um, and so we got another fan of mango steam, but I will, uh, I'll move forward. So we're really excited to have Tanisha Agramante here with us today. Um, how this developed, this connection developed is that for those of you who aren't aware, Motorola Solutions is a company that's been in the research park since fall of 2019. 
Um, the Motorola has a much longer uh, history in the research part, but we won't get into that right now. But um, we are very lucky to have a very dynamic leader who also happens to be a University of Illinois alum, Craig Ibbotson. And I, we saw him earlier. He gave a little wave and showed the office over at the Atkins building. And uh, Craig happened to post one day about this uh, new employee who had joined the Motorola Solutions team and how dynamic and impressive she was. And so I decided, you know, in this world of Zoom that we were in, and, and hopefully we will be able to have the opportunity to meet again in person at some point soon. But one of the benefits of this world is that we are able to invite speakers from places that might not have easily traveled to us in the past. And so um, I just thought it would be wonderful if we could invite Tanisha to share some of the wisdom that she shared um, with the, the Motorola Solutions team in the research park with the rest of our women in tech community. Um, uh, Tanisha Agramante is a highly regarded civil rights champion. Her personal and professional mission is to advance equitable opportunities uh, for all. She has over 25 years of experience um, in the equal op employment opportunity, diversity, civil rights, and human relations arenas and uh, we are excited that she is here to tell some more maybe personal stories as a uh, not just about um, her, her own personal journey but some of the things that she's encountered in her current role which is as the Motorola Chief Diversity Officer. So uh, welcome Tanisha. I believe you're coming to us from the East Coast today. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. I am joining you from the wonderful world of Baltimore, Maryland, just a little bit north of Baltimore here on a very cloudy overcast day. So hello, everyone. Again, Laura, thank you for that warm introduction. Hi, Laura, Kathy, Beth, I want to thank you all for your involvement and uh, for being responsible me, me being here today. And Craig, I wanna thank you for even putting my name uh, forward for their consideration. I have a lot of adoration and respect for Craig and I will share a little story on why later on. So for everyone, I think we have what, about 40 minutes, approximately 39 minutes. I wanna make sure that I reserve a lot of time for Q and A. So what I decided to do um, Craig maybe knows this about me or not. I'm an extemporaneous speaker, so I don't really like to prepare for speaking engagements. I have some things in my head, like what keeps me up at night as a chief diversity officer. And then I have some personal stories of lessons learned in my career journey. So is it okay with you if I share a couple of points on each of those and then we reserve most of the time for Q&A? All right. Great. I think I saw some head nods. I think I had some affirmations <laughs> there. Um, oh, I was looking at Zoe. I want to start with you. Uh, Zoe, I think it was the one who said about watermelon and salt. Was that right? I was off camera and I didn't get it, but I think it was Zoe who, who said that. So I also love watermelon. The craziest part about that is as a chief diversity officer, I'm acutely aware of the stereotype of African-Americans and watermelons. And so it's sad to say that sometimes I may not be honest and candid that that is my favorite fruit just because I feel like I might reinforce the stereotypes. But what I thought was so interesting about what Zoe said and where there's a connection is I was born in a little town in Texas and I was raised eating watermelon with salt, also peaches with salt, every piece of fruit with salt. I moved to New York when I was five years old. And I remember my cousin and I sitting on the uh, like the, the steps, what do you call it? Uh, like of a brownstone and you're on the steps. I can't remember what it's called because it's not a porch. Stoop. That's like a Southern stoop. thing. Stoop. Thank you. It was not coming to me like stoop. We were on the stoop and we were eating our watermelon like in our hands like this. My nails are not painted, so I'm trying to keep my hands like this. Like we had our watermelon like this and we sprinkled our little salt and we were eating like this and spitting out the seeds. And I remember some kids coming up to us, all African-American, and they go, you guys are so country. And we're like, country? <laughs> and it's like, you don't eat watermelon without fork and, you know, knife. And why are you putting salt on watermelon? <laughs> like, it's a fruit. You don't put salt on it. 
I think that was probably, it wasn't until Zoe said that, that was probably now my youngest aha memory, now that I'm aware of it, of cultural differences. And cultural differences that had nothing to do with race and everything to do with geographic upbringing, right? And so here was this intersection of South meeting East Coast and us being made to feel like we were not refined. You know, and I still remember that to this day that there was a lot of shame around that, not only in the way we ate, the foods that we ate, but also that we had these really heavy Texas twang accents. And we would get teased about that, you know, constantly. But it wasn't until just now that I thought about um, that. That's so funny. So anyway, what I want to talk about today is something that's been heavy on my heart. And I think it's really relevant to women in tech in particular. And that is as a chief diversity officer, I've had to over my 20 plus years doing this work address tokenism. And it seems like that has sort of popped up again today, tokenism. And so I wanna read the definition just in case uh, you know someone hasn't heard of that term before, but it's the practice of making only a perfunctory or symbolic effort to do a particular thing. So as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, how we see tokenism play out is when companies may not do the hard work on the front end, and they do the lazy work on the back end of just picking a candidate because that candidate is a woman, because that candidate is a person of color, because that candidate identifies as being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Because when they see that those groups are underrepresented in their organization, instead of doing the hard work of doing the qualitative and the quantitative analysis to identify the root causes for that underrepresentation, they may take the easy way out on the back end. And so I have had to you know, spend considerable time in my career focusing on that because I think people may not have a deep appreciation that tokenism hurts everybody. It hurts the women who are hired as a token because it undermines the reality that we are qualified, that we possess the competencies, that we can do the job. And no one wants to be set up coming in a company where people feel like they were hired for anything other than merit-based reasons, right? And then it undermines diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts all around. And it's not good for the people who feel like they were passed over for someone. So I always address these issues head on. I tell people all the time, I know that when some people hear terms like diversity, equity, and inclusion, what they hear is reverse discrimination, affirmative action, that we're lowering qualification standards, that we're giving a handout. And I always try to educate people that this is not about a handout, but it is about extending a hand. And the way that we extend the hand is by doing the hard work on the front end, trying to determine why these individuals are not represented at levels we would expect. If we look at our relevant labor force and we see that they're out there, but they're not in our organizations, we have to ask ourselves why. Right and correct. So I'll give you one example that I share with people a lot. And that is when I worked for the US Army, um, in particular, the Chemicals Materials Agency, we had a hard time identifying women for our most senior chemical engineer roles. And you know what I got, which is what a lot of people get, you know, they'll say they don't exist. They're not out there. You know, there's not a lot of women in tech. And while that's true, we know that the numbers are still dismal of women in tech. We know that women in tech are underpaid, underrepresented, and sometimes discriminated against. But trust and believe when I look out at all of you here, we're here. They exist, <laughs> right? So it matter is, are we being proactive in finding them? And when we find them, are we making sure that if they apply for our jobs, that they're getting full and fair consideration, that we will not allow our unconscious biases to seep in and exclude them 
from full and fair consideration. And then once we get them in the door to make sure that it wasn't perfunctory, are we ensuring that we're fostering an environment that's welcoming of them? That when they raise their hands and they give their ideas and lend um, their intellectual capital, that we show them we value it by listening to them, considering what they're saying and implementing it, right? So this is how this happens when it's unintentional. So at the Chemical Materials Agency, when we couldn't find the individuals and there was an assumption they just are not out there. You know what it turns out the problem was? In our best qualified description. So let's say someone applies for a job, they make the cert, meaning they make, they make the list, right? Because they meet the minimum qualifications. But then there's this next step of do you, are you best qualified, right? Well, for the best qualified, the criteria was, or one, a criterion was that the candidate has worked at a island that had been closed for 10 years. Now on this island is where we destroyed the nation stockpile of chemical weapons. The only people that had been deployed to that island most of the time were active duty service people. You can imagine 20 years ago, how many women were chemical engineers <laughs> in the army? And then on top of that, to get deployed to an island where it's mostly men for a six month assignment. Do you think they would have been doing that? No, there would have been all kinds of reasons why a woman probably should not have been sent to that island, even if she was active duty and in there. So when I went back to them and I said, is that really a bona fide requirement? Like, is, is that even current anymore? Like someone needs this 10 years dated experience and they go, you know what? We didn't even realize that was still in there. No, that's not necessary. Guess what happened? Can anyone tell me what happened when we removed that as part of our best qualification criteria? Now, I'm, I'm really asking you, it's not rhetorical, okay? So women <laughs> applied, oh, yes. Applications. Yes. And now here's the crazy part. They were already applying. They were just not making it through because of that evaluation and assessment, right? So once we removed that, guess what happened? Two women got hired the next time. Did they get hired because they were not qualified? No. You know, they got hired because they were not only qualified, but we removed the impediment that was keeping them from getting full and fair consideration. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I share that story because I want people to understand that, again, this is not about, I don't know why my eyes are running. This is not about a handout. This is really about making sure that the path is clear of obstacles for people who are not currently represented in our workforce. So I'm gonna pause there because that was a lot of story and I wanna make sure it doesn't sound like I'm just speaking at you and I'm preaching at, does anyone have any questions on what I just shared or any thoughts around tokenism? Or is everybody still eating? <laughs> I really like the phrase that you're using, the full and fair consideration. Um, I'm not sure if that is a, um, if that's a legal term or if it's one that, that you use for the, um, that you use yourself for the sake of clarity, but I think it, um, I think it very clearly and accurately helps to describe what it, what it is, the intention is versus mm -hmm. what it's not. Mm -hmm. No, I really appreciate that. Was that Beth? Because I'm sort of scrolling through the top to see. Yes, yes, it was Beth. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Yeah, and I don't know when I started using that or why, but I use it because it takes away the ambiguity around the perfunctory consideration, <laughs> right? So it's like, yeah, you know, we interviewed them, whatever, but what a lot of people don't realize sometimes and we see in companies is something I call the phantom vacancy announcement. Do you know what that is? Has anyone ever heard of that? It's a phantom requisition. That means they never really had an intent to hire someone else. They already had in mind who they want for the job. 
And what happens though, is you have all these people get excited because they really think they have an opportunity and they go out and they spend days doing their resume and taking the time to apply for a position, but someone already had someone in mind. So when I say full and fair consideration, that's what I'm talking about. There are no preconceived of who you want, what abilities they have, so that when that person is front of you, everyone has an equal opportunity to be considered for the job. The other thing I want to talk about, and this one is kind of heavy, you know, and it's kind of a sensitive subject, but I want to talk about women supporting women. And some women have said to me that sometimes we can be our worst enemy, right? That we don't really support each other. We pick apart each other. Maybe we don't hire each other. We're not in our own networks. And I don't know, we can have some conversations around that. But I want to tell you one of the things that I had to humble myself and be very honest with myself about guarding my words and my actions, so many years ago, um, I was talking to someone who reports to me and I made a similar comment. And I said, you know, I just don't remember a woman ever supporting me for promotion or anything. It's always been men who helped me. And I remember her leaning like this and she goes, really? That hasn't been my experience. And she didn't say it in a judgmental way, but for whatever reason, I felt like really horrible <laughs> that I had just said that, but it caused me to really think. And years later, I, I still remind her of this moment of clarity for me, a aha moment where I was perpetuating this. And I had to really think and ask myself, why did you just say that? Like, there's no woman who's ever helped you. And I had to go back to my mom. My mom is the first woman who would move mountains and boulders for me. She's a woman. She supported me. The teachers that I had that recognized talents in me and capabilities in me that I didn't see in myself, they were women. People who fed me, housed me when I was in college and trying to pay my way through school and at times had to put two dollars worth of gas in my gas tank and sit in classrooms with my stomach rumbling because I couldn't afford to eat and they offered me lunch those were women so I only say that to you to say be careful about our words because our words become our thoughts our thoughts become our actions right and represent us. And I think I messed that whole thing up, but you can Google it. I love that <laughs> little saying. But I don't think it's true that we don't support each other. I think there are instances where some women may not have been supportive, just like I think you can find instances of some men who have not been supportive. And while I'm on that, the other thing that I've struggled with as a chief diversity officer is this concept of allyship. At first, I really pushed against allyship, especially when we talk about it in terms of men being our allies, uh, because I thought it reinforced sort of a paternalistic view and that the only way we could make it would be with men. So this is where there are opportunities to sort of do some introspection about the way that you think and see the world and think more broadly. And then I realized that the reality is that there are not enough women at the top to rely solely on women to help us. That this is not just a woman's issue of underrepresentation. It is a we issue. And that the people who have power and influence, regardless of their gender, all have a responsibility to address inequities when it comes to gender disparities. And that allowed me to think more broadly about this and not narrowly. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Just sharing again, introspection in terms of growth and the way that I look at things. And I share this because I tell people, it doesn't matter that I've been doing this for 20 plus years. I'm still a human. I still am a woman. I'm a black woman. I'm a mother. I am a sister to someone. And over time, my thinking evolved. And I think that gives license to other people to give themselves grace as well. 
that we're all growing. The person that you are today hopefully will not be the person you are 10 years from now because you'll grow. You'll have different exposure, different experiences. So again, I'm going to stop there and see if there are any thoughts. Tanisha, do you think that it's women taking for granted that other women have helped, that they should be helping them and more of a a longing sometimes for us as women to see validation of men in our work, that, that therefore when they do that, that we appreciate it more and think of them as the champions more so than the women that were behind us all the way or that did more subtle things in our, our life that we didn't necessarily take as, as the grandiosity that if a man did the same thing. Oh my goodness, Laura, I think you hit the nail on the head. I definitely think that that's a part of it. You know, it's just like anyone who's a parent you could tell your children things a million times and they will not believe you because you're old. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you haven't been through what they've been through, right? Someone else tells them the same thing and they go, oh my God, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, that kind of thing. And it's the same with spouses and different relationships. I actually, my son-in-law is a firefighter and um, I was, I had used the word firefighter and he said, do you know there are some fire, there are some women who don't like that term. And I said, why? And he said, some feel like it's a badge of honor to be called a fireman, like they've been accepted into the fold. And I've heard women say they think it's a compliment when a man says, you're like one of the boys, you're like one of the guys. It's almost like they feel like they've made it into this club that others haven't been able to ascend to. So Laura, to your point, I, I do think that is part of it, right? And it's worth examining. Yeah, I like what you said about that. I think that's true. A feeling that they've somehow risen to be equal with the men. And there's a little danger in that, of that mindset mm -hmm. for all of us as, as peers too. Mm -hmm. I, I and you know what's interesting? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. No, I was, I was just going to echo that in terms of having been working in tech you know, working in large, predominantly male environments, right, for 20 plus years, where it's kind of the, where that, that's what's normalized, right, the maleness is normalized, and so that's what we should be aspiring to, or, you know, or, or, um, or that's the, it's easy to fall into, I think people fall to, into thinking that way, um, but I was just gonna, um, anyway, that was my comment on that, so I'll, I have, I had a different comment I was gonna make, but I'll, finish this. I'll, I'll yield to you to finish this to follow up first. Okay. I'm going to say one thing and then I'm going to go right back to you for the other point. I love what you just said. And I think it's almost like what maybe some people haven't given deep thought to is how that helps perpetuate the stereotypes of being a woman, right? So if the goal is to be accepted for masculine expressing stereotypical sort of masculine traits or behaviors, then it almost perpetuates that if women act in a way that has stereotypically been frowned upon, right? It just doesn't help the cause. <laughs> you know, like I was told as a woman, hide your femininity, you know, especially in a military environment, DOD like wear dark colors, don't wear dangling earrings, wear modest makeup because you don't want to be seen as soft, you know? So that perpetuates that I can't look a particular way and still be effective, still command respect. Okay, what was the other thing you were going to say? Um, so to that question of, it, it plays into the, women helping women again in the same ways. And I, I'm an overthinker, but um, a conversation I was having with myself recently in that sense is, is the ways in which women help women. Because again, because, so if I'm a woman in a predominantly male environment and I do want to help another woman, you know, um, I think sometimes women may help others in ways that is not immediately apparent to the woman that's being helped, right? Because if I potentially go out there in ways that may be seen as typically feminine to try to cheerlead for them or support them, then you know you wonder is that is that actually going to help them or is that potentially going to be 
a detriment because mm-hmm. well, it's a woman cheering for them. You know, whether it's the woman cheering for them or it's the or it's the, the black woman cheering for them, if it's another black person, you know, the, those kinds of you know perceptions versus um, supporting them in a meeting or supporting you know just feedback through regular channels, et cetera. So it's I think it, it, you do that dance with yourself as well as how far you know can I go to support them obvi- you know in a way that's visible right you know what I mean mm-hmm. versus again play, playing by those rules that the guys created so it's just it's this kind of it is a, it's a vicious cycle yes yeah because on one hand what I hear you saying and correct me if I'm wrong there's all these things playing in our mind when we prepare to support someone Will it be perceived as bias or favoritism if I'm supporting someone who looks like me, who has a shared identity with me? And I just don't know if everyone thinks about that, <laughs> right? And, and so it's this fear of if I hired, you know, Laura, would someone think I hired her just because she was a woman and I'm a woman? You know, but I don't think, I don't know if everybody thinks like that, right? So it's another part of that conversation. So thank you for that, I appreciate. And I do wanna make a couple of points before I forget because we have a lot of Motorola interns in the house and we have some uh, new entrants into the workforce. I know at Research Park, um, new. I wanna talk about uh, diversity just in general, how hard it is to honor a lot of perspectives right? Recognizing that you're not going to please everyone. That's one thing that I've had to accept, that part of diversity is you have so many people, even on this call, who come into this space with so many different experiences, right? And you want to honor that. So I think of new interns that come in and they're, they're entering the workforce for the first time, and maybe their voices are not heard the way that they should be heard in the workplace because maybe somebody discounts and think, well, they're, they're young. They said that because they're young or they're inexperienced and stuff. And I will tell you, I've learned so much from young people, even the people who've pushed me to think differently. And I want it to be dismissive. <laughs> I want it to, you know, anytime somebody says something that we don't like, and it makes us uncomfortable because it bucks against our belief system, the first thing we do is try to find something about them to dismiss it, right? If we can discredit them in some kind of way, then that will help us devalue. But I will tell you, I hope that, um, and I heard what you said, Laura, I love that I've hired a lot of women and not apologize. I love it. (laughs) He said most qualified. (laughs) Um, uh, But for the interns, I wanna tell you, Please don't hide your voice. Uh, Please make sure that during this time, you make the most of your experience because we learn so much from you. So I want to make sure that you feel welcome to use your voice, ask questions. Um, We wouldn't have you here if we didn't think there was a benefit of having you. So I wanted to make sure that I say that. And then I, I want to talk real quick about leaning into my own personal superpower. So Craig and I first met, Craig called me and he was asking me about something he was doing with the interns. And in that conversation, I talked to him about um, an initiative I started in the federal government called the First Generation Professionals Initiative. And I started that initiative because as a civil rights practitioner, an EEO practitioner, a diversity and inclusion practitioner, first of all, I don't believe that any single diversity identity is like the sole reason for inequities. I think it's intersection is huge. You know, it's like two identities and it compounds the disparities. One of the things that I realized uh, when I would be on panels and people would ask me about my career trajectory, how I became a senior executive service member in the federal government, I remember every time I would talk about obstacles for me, it had nothing to do with me being black, had nothing to do with me being female, but what it did have to do with me is being poor, being raised poor. (laughs) You know, it had to do with me being born to a single teen mom who sacrificed her dreams of going to college to raise me. And so that 
even though I was an at-risk youth. And when I say at-risk youth, the first time I was suspended from school, I was eight years old in the third grade for assaulting a teacher. I continued to get suspended from school for fighting and other infractions until I was expelled from all schools in Los Angeles. I don't think anyone thought that I would ever graduate high school. I think they thought I would be dead or in jail. That was the path I was on. That was the label I had. That is how teachers treated me. Um, in community college, and I only ended up in community college because my mom was one of these Southern women where she was like, you will not lay up in my house without a job and being in school, <laughs> right? So I went to community college because that's all I, you know, I knew. But now I I'm, I'm, feel very fortunate I did do that. But I share that story to say, even going to college, it occurred to me that because my mom had not graduated college, because my mom had not held any professional uh, positions, I was not postured the same way some of my peers who came from middle class and upper class backgrounds. And I'll use my daughter as just an example for that. When my middle child graduated college, I remember she texted her dad and me and she goes, I have this job interview. What questions should I ask? What should I do? And immediately we're firing off texts, right? I'm like, go in my closet. I want you to get my power navy blue pent stripe suit. I want you to get the two inch heels. Make sure you wear this jewelry. I want you to print your resume on this type of paper. I want you to go on their website, look at these things. And then dad told her what to do, you know, from his perspective. And I remember this day clear, like it was yesterday when she texted us with her offer letter attached. And I remember sitting back in my chair thinking to myself, wow, the 22 year old her would have demolished the 22 year old me. Like she had access to so many resources that I did not have access to. People don't realize things like getting coveted unpaid internships in DC, in New York, in Atlanta, where your parents can fund you for eight weeks to be in those high cost of living areas, take care of your rent, your transportation, give you professional clothes to wear during an internship. That is not available to everybody. Not everybody has someone to turn to to help with assistance with writing a resume to prep them for an interview. You know, all those type of things that people with means have a little more access to, have traveled and all of that. Um, so I just remember thinking to myself, wow. Um, and I did what I'm supposed to do. She, she's where she was supposed to be. But I think about the girls who were competing with her, the boys competing with her who didn't have that. So that's why I started that initiative because I honestly believe that humble beginnings should not limit how far one's talents and drive will take them. And that no race, no gender, no sexual orientation gets reprieved from discrimination because of class. And I do believe that there is a class ceiling, not a glass ceiling. I do believe in that too, but I'm saying, I'm saying class ceiling. And it plays out in how you show up, right? We judge people within the first few seconds of seeing them. We see their race first, we see their gender second. But we make so many judgments and assessments on how people show up, how they dress, how they speak and how they behave. And many times there are so many stereotypes about accents from the Appalachian region, Southern region, right? Even Boston, that's not an academic Bostonian accent, but you know the one I'm talking about, like a blue class Boston accent, a Jersey girl, you know, sort of accent, the Bronx, these, accents that are associated with blue collar, working class, you know, environment. And we make assessments about people intellect based on those type of things and, you know, the type of clothes that they have. So anyway, um, starting that, and I lost my train of thought, but I do want to share one thing that even though I had ascended to the highest ranks in the government, I think less than uh, 1% of federal employees get to the rank that I rose to, I still dealt with imposter syndrome because of my background. 
And that's crazy because people think that once you get to a certain point, you know, why would you ever question your right to be in the room or in the space or that you deserve to be there, you earn to be there. But I'm going to share something with you that someone said to me, and I hope it helps someone on this call. Maybe one person needs to hear this. I was talking to a friend of mine, Lauren Leonard, a colleague, and she's much younger than me. And I was telling her I received an invitation to be on a panel. But when they sent me the list of prospective panelists, and they all had all these letters behind their name, they had authored books, they had been on a speaking circuit, on television, radio, and I thought, why do they want me? Like, I'm not the caliber of these other panelists, right? And so I declined the invitation. Um, and she said, Tanisha, I want you to look at me. Throughout your life, there will be a number of people who will doubt you, but you do not get to be one of those people. So I say that to say, no one in the world would be a better advocate for you than you. And anytime that you start doubting yourself, I want you to think back to times when you've accomplished things, you have overcome things, overcome things and remind yourself that you are good enough and that you deserve to be where you are and that you've worked hard to get in those spaces and lean into the discomfort and the uncomfort. When I leaned into the fact that I was ashamed of coming from low income backgrounds and that I didn't know terms like charger, like, you know, if I'm at someone's house and they go, Tanisha, do you want a charger? And I'm looking at my phone like, nope. I don't need a charger, but they were talking about the little decorative plate that goes under the plate. <laughs> Those are things like associated with people that got money. That's what I think. Like there are some terms that are like class, right? But when I leaned into that, instead of being ashamed of my background, what I thought was, damn girl, you bad. You've overcome a lot in your life. Like if anything, you should be so incredibly proud that you have demonstrated grit, resiliency, determination. The fact that you overcame all that stuff and you're still sitting in the same place as other people, you bad. That's your superpower. So I will end with that. And in the four minutes we got, take any comments or questions. Danielle. Oh, I see a clap. I thought it was, I thought it was a hand raise. <laughs> I'm applauding that. I really am. I, I almost cried because I just, I felt that right here. I really did. So thank you for sharing. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much and for your honesty and your transparency and the courage that it takes to show up and speak um, the reality of where you're from and where we're all from. Thank you. Thank you. And where the interns at? I would like to add one point that it's really very inspiring for, for freshers like us. It really parts a very, very beautiful journey and it really inspires. Okay, now we can also do a lot of stuff. We can also learn. And yes, there might be hardships, but but we'll be able to succeed in them because we have support from each other. Absolutely, Indu. Thank you for that point. Am I pronouncing your name right, Indu? That's guy three. Okay, I've got the, who was it? Guy three. Guy three? Oh, yep. there you go. I see you now. Oh, beautiful picture. Thank, Thank you, you so much uh, for making that point. I, I agree. This is also about us supporting each other. And I forgot to say that. So thank you for um, saying that. We need to support one another, uplift each other, inspire each other. Um, thank you so much. Um, actually, yeah, now, now it is. <laughs> <laughs> I end it. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, amazingly in inspired with your talk as well and all the thoughts you brought up and they resonate with me too. I have gone through similar experiences in my life, both positive and negative. Like, you know, like I, I am a person who see challenges in a positive tense. Um, so 
um, sometimes they are hard, like, but still they are, you know, like uh, we uh, horn ourselves with those, right? And um, mm -hmm. this male prone tradition, you know, like even my parents used to like, I, I have three brothers and a sister. And when we do something good, me and my sister, they, they all, when they want to show love, they say, um son like you know kind of like uh, to show that you are higher than kind of like it's a tradition like we have to i think it's high time that we break it um you know like we don't have to be like uh compared with men to show that we are better we are better mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's something um I, I i'm i'm so happy that i joined your talk today like this is a wonderful talk Amazing. Thank you so much. And I, you make such a wonderful point around that, that some of these biases are so deeply entrenched right. in our customs, in our cultures. I mean, I'm sure you and I could have a whole nother conversation on colorism mm -hmm. because I know that that impact, you know, right? So there's, there's all these things that we've been taught and they show up in different ways in the culture and how how they're talked about. So thank you for that, Indu. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm looking at uh, believe in yourself, people, <laughs> your badass self. That's right. Um, great. And then, okay, finally, one more thing, just to make sure. Two things I think are real important: career roadmaps and being relevant. This is for intern, turn CEOs, everybody. I think we all know that in order to be successful and achieve your goals, you have to be relevant to somebody. <laughs> that means that they have to have uh, find value in either what you are producing, selling, marketing, whatever. So in your job, try to make sure that you find the connection between what you do and how that helps the company succeed that is your relevance to a company. And in terms of your career roadmap, I always tell my mentees, ask yourself these questions. Where do you want to go or be? You got to know your destination. And then ask, when do you want to get there? What could be roadblocks on your journey to get there? Who do you need to help you get there in your support network and circle? And what resources and tools you need to do? Everybody should be doing that. Okay, so thank you so much for having me. I'll turn it back over to Laura. Thank you so much, Tanisha. It was so wonderful to have you join us. And if you do make it to Illinois, um, I hope you will let us know because we would love to host you here in the research park. And, um, and if you get the chance to visit us, that would be fantastic. But in the meantime, um, thanks to all of you who joined us for participating. This is a really great engaged audience. I hope you're, it sounds like everyone's as inspired as I am. So thank you so much um, for being with us today, Tanisha. Thanks to the Motorola Solutions team for introducing us. And we look forward to seeing you all hopefully in person at some point soon. So hope everybody has a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, I love your necklace, Kathy. Thank you. By the way, yes. Everyone have a great rest of your day.